you see how the eyes. For now, this shot will go a certain distance. All right, so the timing. But I'll, I'll take this. It starts to feel like a scene. <laughs> very good. Okay, there's some very. Without me, we got heads on this. Don't think I'll show you any compassion. Coming straight yeah. back. I'm not going to say that monologue. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Is anyone really interested? It's do I seem unduly concerned? Okay. Just tell me what happened with Sanford. Yeah, just want to put it on. Sure, fine, no problem. I work as lead consultant for the Brady campaign at Peterson Wyatt. I've secured places for everyone in this room with no change. Have them sign and file with the Ethics Committee. Do I seem unduly concerned? All right. So it's Sloan et al. versus Connors and who else? The city. Your reputation might survive the move to some third tier outfit to fight a loser. I, I read ethics regs when I want to look busy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's John sure. is he? Creation in action here. Come on, <laughs> roll it. Um, so you're, you're I thought you got the picture of him doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Right, yeah. Lock, lock it up, Yes. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Uh, so, no. Not even in the best interest. Okay, stand by! <laughs> very good. It's a very good joke. Because, because of the journey we Are you okay with what's outside? Is that recognizable? Yeah. Blind. You mean you felt, you know, uh, relaxed and confident. Yeah. Health only mark. Mighty ya. Yeah, she had a bit of a idea where the glass wall seriously self to win I won't protest but as me the end is my concern you goody two-shoes can fret over the means you need me the end that disappeared into the distance your boom. 
action. <laughs> breach. A clear breach. <laughs> Maybe we should get a copy of this for you. Could you just... Well, because Senate ethics rules prevents lobbyists from arranging overseas travel for members of Congress. Indeed. Do you know what this is? Okay, and uh, action. The part just fitted her so perfectly, I felt. Um, uh, she and I have been looking for something to do together uh, since we worked on this film called The Debt, which is, uh, you know, when she wasn't Jessica Chastain, as it were, when she made that movie. She'd made Tree of Life. Uh, but it hadn't been released at that point. But all the other films for which she's subsequently become known had not been made at that point. So. Uh, you know, that was a Jessica I knew as a sort of undiscovered diamond, really. And uh, I was hugely impressed by her then. And uh, I couldn't sort of eradicate the idea of her in the part uh, once I'd read the script. So around about the time that I got the opportunity to go meet Film Nation to talk about it, literally that morning I was in New York for an opening of another film of mine and I got a message back from from Hilda saying Jessica's read it, loves it, wants to do it with you. It's very enjoyable to read a smart script. Uh, you know, the, the, I suppose the natural language of all of the people in this uh, film is irony, the language of irony and indirection. It's extremely witty. Um, it's very funny. Uh, but mainly it's surprising because obviously you're dealing in a world where everything is strategy. You know, it's about, it's about the world of lobbying and about how you influence people, how you bring them around to your point of view, how you secure influence in various ways. It's of course a hugely discredited uh, industry. And as a director, you know, that's a kind of a gift because this woman is a complete and utter obsessive. I mean, she's driven by a, an obsessive need to, to win, uh, to, to win the argument, to win the case, whatever it might be. And uh, as you probably know, she takes not very many prisoners in the process of doing that and sails very close to the wind and employs tactics that might raise eyebrows in various quarters. So um, harnessing that energy is where the, the kind of, the mise-en-scene proceeds from really. Um, she barely ever sits down, she barely ever stops to rest. But its greatest weapon, the greatest weapon the script has, um, and this is a sort of overall spoiler alert, is that it's extraordinarily surprising. It never lands where you think it's going to land, even within a given scene. The movie tends to swerve off in a direction you're not expecting. 
is one of the things uh, about it, uh, which I think uh, make it very, very compelling. Um, and secondarily, and this is something I began to realize the more I got to grips with it and when I started to cast it, 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 it has multiple storylines involving you know, an enormous number of characters. She has a very, very unusual talent. She's uh, amazingly transparent as an actress. You can see everything that is happening to her. She has the gift of making something manifest without showing you what she's doing. Um, uh, that's pretty unusual. She has a tremendous emotional intelligence about how, where to pitch something emotionally and can adjust that very easily. Obviously, we had a huge advantage, which is that we worked together before, and so we knew each other's temperatures. Um, but, you know, she comes with an astonishing kind of battery of skills, uh, which God knows this part calls for. You know, it, one of the appeals of the script to, to me, and I think a, a potential appeal for an audience, I always think there's a sort of through the looking glass, not through the looking glass, through the keyhole, I should say, quality to this piece, which is that it's a world people don't really know anything about. If you ask people what a lobbyist does, a lot of them will draw a blank and not, not really be able to describe that. Or So I think at one level the, the film is, is just an insight into uh, a world which is an integral part, for better or worse, of the way the American political procedure, the American political process unfolds. That in itself is very, very interesting. Uh, it becomes more interesting, as I said, because she's practicing the dark arts of that kind of world as well, which makes her a curiously kind of riveting and fascinating creature to watch. Um, because, and this is, you know, I suppose the, the, the most important part of the whole thing, because it takes on a very, very, very divisive subject, it might have taken on another subject because, as I said, the film is really about that character as much as it is anything else. That's what I would position it as. It's a portrait of a very extraordinary uh, creature. One thing movies do better than anything else, novels even, um, a more complex medium in some ways, is, is take you into the mind and heart of a particular character, a particular point of view. And this is really an unusual creation, this character. She's really, and not just because of what she does and the way she does it, but also, let's face it, because of her gender. You know, this movie, if you actually unpacked it in a certain kind of way, is a classic American movie about an outsider, somebody who refuses to toe the line, who refuses to play by the system's rules, who, who you know, swims against the current, goes against the grain. And all of those things, if I described that to you, the image of a man will come up in your head. Uh, and in this case, uh, it isn't a man, it's a woman. And the other big thing about this film is it's that very, very unusual thing, which is a, a central female character who's defined by all the things that a male would normally be defined by. A relationship develops between Elizabeth Sloan and uh, this girl Esme, who's played by Gugu Mbata Raw. Um, it's probably true to say that uh, Elizabeth somehow tends to focus on a character that is potentially a, a sort of embryonic version of herself. She does it in the firm that she's already been a part of. This is a very, very, initially, very close relationship with um, a character called Jane, who's played by Alison Pill. And when she changes sides to her chagrin, her protege doesn't choose to go with her. And, um, and as a result, she somehow fo focuses like a laser beam on this girl in the... Uh, in the new outfit as somebody who's smart, very intelligent, very motivated, 
very tireless, and um, that becomes a very significant relationship in the film. Gugu Goo Goo is, of course, not an unknown quantity, but she's, on the other hand, just emerging into the spotlight where she will <laughs> be a fixture, I expect. Um, uh, you know, uh, John Lithgow, who's an actor I have a very long history with. We worked together on stage 35 years ago, a couple of times, and I've always loved and admired, and there was a, a perfect role for him, and it just happened to fit perfectly in his schedule. Amazing actor Michael Stuhlbarg, you know, who is quite extraordinary ability to transform himself completely from one role to another. It plays Elizabeth's chief kind of antagonist, uh, her former colleague in the firm that, that uh, she used to work for, who now becomes her sort of sworn enemy on the other side of the argument in the film. Fantastically surprising actor. Um, sort of burrows deep inside what he's doing and never gives you a a line reading or a, 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 a kind of take on a particular moment or a situation that you have expected or anticipated. Very exciting actor. Mark Strong, you know, in a role that people wouldn't necessarily expect him uh, to play, was really the second lead of the film, huge part, playing uh, Elizabeth's employer, her, her new employer, her sort of moral conscience, and to an extent her antagonist. Um, and Mark is, you know, in a, my, my country he has a, a golden reputation as being the actor's actor. There's not a director or an actor that he's ever worked with that doesn't have a massive admiration for him. Hey, Vale here. Like me, are you a movie lover? Well, a list has been released of the top 100 films of the 21st century, and we have cut it down to give you the top 10 films as selected by 177 film critics from around the world. At number 10, No Country for All Men by Joe and Ethan Cohen from 2007. At number 9, A Separation by Asghar Farahadi from 2011. Number 8, Yi Yi, A One and uh, A Two by Edward Yang from 2000. Number 7, The Tree of Life by Terence Malik from 2011. Number 6, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind by Michael Gondry from 2004. Number 5, Boyhood by Richard Linklater from 2014. Number Number four, Spirited Away uh, by Ayao Mikayadzi uh, from 2001. Number three, There Will Be Blood by Paul Thomas Anderson from 2007. Number two, In the Mood for Love by Wong Karvai from 2000. And number one, Mulholland Drive by David Lynch from 2001. Do you agree with this list? How many of these films have you seen? Let us know in the comments below. And remember, if you haven't already done it, to subscribe to our channel for all the latest trailer releases. Bye-bye.